Good morning. Thank, thank you guys. They had to improvise this morning. We had a little malfunction backstage, so we had to do one more song. So I'm glad they knew one more song. That's, that's good, good to hear. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't mind it. We're getting near the end of the semester, so I wanted to take a minute just to recognize some of the people that have made this semester so successful. Last night in the new music auditorium, they had six, a packed house with a 400 voice choir doing Handel's Messiah. Was, how many of you were there for the few? It's only seat 1600, but we, uh, we're so proud of that new facility and I wanted to congratulate Vernon Whaley. Vernon, if you'd come up. Just tell us a little bit about the event last night and about the, uh, about the new facility and its uniqueness. Well, it's incredible. Last night we did uh, Handel's Messiah for the first half of our Christmas on the Boulevard. The second half we did uh, a whole series of Christmas carols and favorite songs, and we featured uh, Brock Snow's composition of uh, Carol of the Bells. And that brought the house down. It was tremendous to see that happen. The building is unique in many ways, but the concert hall is the only one like it on the East Coast. It allows us to go from a very acoustic sound at the very beginning, which we did the Messiah in, and then we can change the entire room and, and activate what we call the Constellation Acoustic System and allow the second half to be done with drums and electronic uh, instruments and so forth. So we were able to try out the whole building and do what we needed and felt like that we were going to be able to do in the building. And it weighs through proceed our expectations. Cannot wait for everybody to come and see what's going on. This is your building. This belongs to the university, and we just are absolutely thrilled to be able to be part of it. All right. I'm a, I'm a, he didn't know he was going to be down here until about five minutes ago when I <laughs> called him, but I'm going to put you on the spot. What about an encore performance before, before they leave? Uh, we might could do that. Mike could? Okay. If, okay. If the president wants it, we'll do it. <laughs> All right. Let's, <laughs> that's awesome. I, I figured if I asked him in front of everybody, it'd be hard for him to say no. So <laughs> we didn't figure out the time. We're glad to do it. Well, thank you. Thank you. For, thank you. Right. Yeah. And and just this week, we got news that's probably the biggest news the university's received in many, many years. We were accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools in 1980. Every 10 years, we go through a reaffirmation where a team of, um, of professors and presidents of other schools spends a lot of time here. You know, you, I know you all, all are under a lot of stress with exams, but your faculty has been under stress for two years working on this process. It starts at the faculty level, it, it goes up to the provost's office, and it's something that's so, so involved and so intense. And I got a, a text this morning from a former president of Liberty, Dr. John Boric, show, telling me about several, couple major universities who went through the process with us, who are now on warning and probation. But Liberty got the news this week, thanks to the efforts of your faculty, and our provost's office that Liberty was reaffirmed for another 10 years. And that was in spite of all the controversy I stirred up over the last year, so I was proud of that. But, but Kevin, Kevin Corsini from the provost's office is here to tell you a little bit about the process. We're so proud of the provost's office and all the faculty and this monumental achievement. So you get pretty excited at the end of the semester, right? About the time you finish final exams? We're about there, right? I gotta tell you, for the last two years, our office has been working towards our final exam for Liberty University. And I'm here to tell you, this doesn't just benefit us, it, it benefits every single person in this room, and we got an A+. This has been a 10-year process that benefits you, it benefits the university, it'll benefit each class subsequent for the next decade. Uh, we've been working on this for the last several years, working back and forth with SACS, went down really not knowing what to anticipate. Uh, we got feedback from them earlier in the year, they were on campus, visited, uh, and while we were down there, we could not have gotten a better report from SACS. Uh, we've got a full reaffirmation for the next 10 years. This is a fully accredited school, uh, and it's something that will benefit all of us 
uh, to God be the glory. God really prioritized this in our lives and made it a successful venture. So congratulations to each one of us, and we thank the faculty, the deans, the staff, everyone who was involved. Uh, it was a team effort. Well, without that. Without that accreditation, there's no student loans, there's no federal aid, there's nothing. It's, so it's, it, without it, it, it's almost impossible for a school to operate. So Dr. Hawkins in the provost's office, he couldn't be here this morning, but Kevin represents him, and we just um, thank you all so much and so proud. Thank you so much. All right. You know, this year I've been getting emails from David the night before Convo and telling me who's speaking the next day, and I've never, I've, I've just been amazed over and over at the slate of speakers that, that David Nasser was able to bring together for this semester. I wish you'd give David a hand for an incredible job. And this morning is no exception. We, we have, we're so honored to have with us the chairman and editor-in-chief of Forbes magazine, four-time Crystal Owl, Crystal Owl Award winner. The prize is given to financial journalists whose economic forecast for the coming year proved to be the most accurate. In both 1996 and 2000, Steve campaigned vigorously for the Republican nomination for the presidency. He spoke here at that time. But his key platforms were flat tax, medical savings accounts, a new social security system for all Americans, parental choice of schools for the children, for vouchers and, and uh, school choice initiatives, term limits, and a strong national defense. I wish you'd join me in welcoming back to Liberty University, Mr. Steve Forbes. flagship publication, which is Forbes, obviously. It's, it is the, the industries and the, and the country's leading business magazine. There are more than 900,000 subscribers to it. They reach a worldwide audience of more than 6 million readers. Liberty University, please welcome to the stage, Steve Forbes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. Uh, thank you, President Falwell, for your very, very nice words. And I love that little video. I only wish I had it uh, 15 years ago when uh, my wife and I have five daughters. And uh, during the teen years, that can be challenging. You know, parents during certain years just don't seem to get it. You know, as a kid, two years old is to say no. And then very, very often later in life, you hear from kids you just don't understand. And as my father liked to say that as you grow up, many of you will get married, have kids. My father liked to say, you know you're a successful parent when you become an embarrassment to your children. And so just, just keep that in mind. And I've been, uh, people have uh, said today that, gee, you know, you've been a success in life, you know, share your secrets for success. So in the name of full disclosure, before I get to my remarks on capitalism, uh, let me just uh, share with you a favorite saying of my grandfather. My grandfather founded our company almost 100 years ago in 1917. He was an immigrant to this country. One of ten children, grade school education, came from Scotland. And when he started Forbes, people would ask him, what's the economy going to do? What stock should you buy? Basic questions like that. And my grandfather, being an honest individual, when people would ask uh, what stocks to buy and things like that, he would invariably reply, he would say, you make more money selling the advice than following it. So you're, you're, you're all on notice. Now, it is, it is good fun to be here today. Because first of all, Liberty University, I was just talking with your president, is a very entrepreneurial university, doing things over the years that others have not done, and therefore, to be blunt about it, you're far ahead of the pack. Uh, that accreditation, if that had not gone well, that would have said more about the accreditors than about Liberty University. But even they have to recognize what you've done. We live in an era where things are rapidly changing. 
old ways or giving ways to new ways of doing things. We see it in our business. Everything I learned about a print world, print magazines and the like, just out the window with the rise of the web. We've had to adjust to a new era, no playbook. We live in the kind of a environment where, as the saying goes, you can eat well or sleep well, but not both. I do the eating part well, the sleep part is another matter. But we, we've had to fundamentally change the way we do business. And this gets to something, if uh, those of you who go out and pursue careers in the commercial world, in fact, in any part of the world, is to remember what Peter Drucker, the late great management guru, said. Peter Drucker died several years ago. He's an immigrant from Austria and wrote numerous books on business and business management. And he said, every organization, including businesses, should always remind themselves, what is your purpose? What is your mission? What is it you are trying to do? And if you remind yourself of what is it you're, gonna, you, you're trying to do, especially in the business world where things are so changing so rapidly, if you remind yourself of what your goal is, then you don't get quite as upset or disoriented when the means or the tools to achieve that goal change. With the rise of the web, everything we did changed. Let me just give you one minute on this. For years, we'd print the magazine, do 12 or 1300 articles a year. And fortunately, when the web came, started to really come into form in the mid 1990s, we've made a good decision. We decided that we'd go on the web, do what everyone else was doing, but we made a fundamental decision, and that is we put our web operations in a separate building from the magazine. Why did we do that? Because it's human nature and organizations to bend everything to your immediate purpose. And we knew that if we put this new thing with the print operation, it would never be allowed to flourish not out of malice, but just because you're accustomed to doing things in a certain way. So we put Forbes.com in a separate building, separate staff, separate reporting system. They reported to me and to my brother, not the usual reporting structure. And the thing grew. You know, in those days, amazingly, print publishers thought if they put a printed page online, that was electronic publishing. It was sort of like when movies were, when movies were invented, 120 years ago, people thought that, some people thought that a feature film simply meant filming a stage play. Film a stage play like Othello, you had a feature film. No, very different medium. So we put the thing in a separate building, separate company, the baby prospered, became a good, nice adolescent. And then the time came when we had to combine the two. And it was, to use a word, hell because just on the journalism side, two different cultures trying to meld them together. The dot-com people thought that print journalists were snobs, lazy, content to do an article a week and then pat themselves on the back. The print journalists thought that the dot-com journalists were trash. You know, just turning out stuff here, there, everywhere, not the quality that they're accustomed to. It was very hard to be able to do both. Now, today we take it for granted, but 10 years ago, very, very different, very, very difficult. And the way we create content is different. Yes, we still do 12 or 1300 articles a year, but online, now we have over 1,800 contracted contributors contributing to Forbes.com, experts in various areas, and you are paid by the traffic you generate. So in addition to the 1,200 print articles which we put online, we now have over 110,000 submissions on Forbes.com. Our monthly traffic is now more than 90 million unique visitors a month. Different world, but gets to what my grandfather believed. My grandfather said in the first issue of Forbes, he said, the purpose of business is to produce happiness, not to pile up money. He believed in entrepreneurial capitalism. He realized the f failings of people, but he saw Forbes, and we see it today, as like a, like a, 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 a critic, a critic uh, for, say, plays. We love it when a, a production is done right, but when it's done wrong, we will criticize it. But we believe, we believe in entrepreneurial capitalism. We believe in entrepreneurial capitalism because entrepreneurial capitalism rose up because of what you represent here today. 
Tom Soul and others have asked a basic question. You probably have heard it yourself. It gets to the nubbin of our existence, and that is, what is the difference between us today and people of the Stone Age? Same physical bodies, same planet, same appetites, same resources. What's the difference between us and people of the Stone Age? Basic difference is we have more knowledge. That's the basic difference. Even if you suffer physical catastrophes, tsunamis, wars, if knowledge is not destroyed, you can come back again, rebuild and move forward. And knowledge comes from constant experimentation, what Thomas Edison called trial and error. And that's why out in the world you have to be unafraid of the fact that you will fail from time to time. It's never a smooth path. And you'll be jostled. You'll get crises you didn't anticipate. It's part of learning. And also, failure does not mean nothing good comes from it. None of you are old enough, but back in the 80s and 90s, Apple came out with a new product, late 80s, early 1990s, called the Newton. It was a handheld device. It flopped in the marketplace. But the technology in that failure laid the basis for Steve Jobs in the future for the iPad, iPhone, iPod, what we might call it noble failure, learning from what doesn't work, experimentation, searching. And this gets to also one of the great myths is that there's a difference between science and religion. The real history of the Western world, Judeo-Christian tradition, is that it was the rise of Judaism and then Christianity that enabled us to move forward because these faiths emphasize curiosity, searching for how God's world worked instead of saying, this is it, that's it. And that curiosity led to what we now call science, which flourished in the West as nowhere else in the world. You know, they all talk about Galileo's trial before the Vatican hundreds of years ago. But if you actually look what was going on at that time, all of the great discoveries in astronomy and science in those early years came from priests, came from priests. The man who invented modern physics, Lisa Pricker is of modern physics. Isaac Newton spent a lot of time studying religion and faith. They didn't see it as polar opposites. They saw it as one and the same, curiosity, finding out how God's world worked. And that enabled us to make these great rises. And the truth about the power of knowledge can be seen today, as we know, as the 75th anniversary of the attack on us at Pearl Harbor. Changed fundamentally world history and American history. World War II was devastating in Europe and Japan, massive physical destruction, tens of millions of lives lost, and experts thought that after that conflict it would take decades, generations, for the world to recover. But the thing is, despite that loss of life, despite that physical destruction, the fact of the matter is knowledge was not destroyed. And within a handful of years after the end of that terrible conflict, Thanks to the U.S. security military umbrella, which allowed security and people to really strive again, within a few years, Japan and Western Europe exceeded their pre-war levels of production because knowledge was not destroyed. We see it today. Some of you here are from California. Now I'm about to insult your state. <laughs> <laughs> California, California supposedly has a water shortage because of drought. No, what California has is a common sense shortage in its government. And, and the, proof, the proof of it is, the proof of it is, talking about water, take the state of Israel. Israel, as you know, is located in a desert. Rainfall there has been falling. So you'd think they would have a California-like crisis. They don't have a crisis. Why? Because of knowledge and human ingenuity. Israel, the modern state, was formed in 1948. Since then, the population of Israel has grown more than tenfold. Agricultural production in this desert nation has grown 16-fold. Industrial output has grown 50-fold. 
And yet the net use of water in Israel, not per capita, per person, but the whole net use of water in Israel today is 10% less than it was in 1948. How do they do it? Through ingenuity, not letting silly regulations stand in the way. You, a shower head, for example, in Israel feels just as strong as we, what we get here, uses one third of the water. Agriculture, they just don't throw water around. They've had very sophisticated drip technology, technology, drip, drip water, water drip technology. And so they, uh, they, they don't waste water. They don't waste water like they do in California, you know, throwing the water all over the place. Apply it to the crops. It works. And the also big thing is desalination plants, turning water, making it usable again. They have several of them. California, they finally completed a desalination plant. It's about half the capacity of what they have in Israel, typical plant in Israel. Costs three times as much. Took 15 years to do it. That is not an act of God. That is an act of stupidity here on the earth. And so, and so what, 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 this, what this goes to show is, what this goes to show is, when we don't stand in the way of finding knowledge, applying knowledge, trial and error, we, don't, we, we, we turn scarcity into abundance. We don't have to accept a fate of lack of progress and a lesser standard of living. Now, let's take capitalism. I use the word capitalism because sometimes you, you want to say words like free enterprise, uh, free markets, try to, try to soften it up a little bit. Capitalism is a bad word in a lot of circles today. It's encrusted in a lot of destructive myths. Even before the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, capitalism always was seen in a less than glorious light. You know, the myths are that capitalism is cold, based on greed, puts profits before people, the strong crush the weak, stomps down on humanity. It's seen as sort of a slightly corrupt bargain, but hey, it delivers some material standards, nice standard of living. So we put up with this amoral, not so good system. It's never put on the same moral plane as literature or art or writing poems or engaging in philanthropy. It's seen as commerce on one side, philanthropy, polar opposite. And so you see it in Hollywood. Research has shown that in Hollywood, businessmen, and they're usually men, not women, businessmen kill more people in Hollywood movies than serial killers do. And there are two stereotypes. Either the businessman is obesely fat, jowls going up and down in glee, figuring out how to pollute rivers and to destroy people, or they're bony, spindly thin, crackling figures, fingers trying to figure out how to kill your household pet or something like that. And, but the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, commerce and philanthropy, commerce and philanthropy are two sides of the same coin. Now what is the moral basis of free markets, capitalism, whatever name you want to give to it? You succeed only by providing something that somebody else wants. You succeed by meeting the needs and wants of other people. Even if you're that Hollywood caricature, even if you love money, even if you have a terrible personality that makes babies cry and dogs, and, and dogs bark at you when you walk down the street, the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, you're not gonna get that money unless you provide something that somebody else wants. Now, sometimes in terms of the marketplace, this is where you get entrepreneurship. Steve Jobs, late Steve Jobs, was once asked, does Apple do marketing surveys? He said, no, because people don't know what they want until I show them. Putting a product out there, that's what entrepreneurialism is, putting a product or service out there. You don't know if people are gonna take it. And if they do, you both benefit. They get something they want, you succeed. But if you fail, too bad for you, but you're putting something out there, meeting the needs and wants of other people. So even if you're that Hollywood cliche, you're not gonna get it unless you provide something that somebody else wants. And this is, gets to why, without our realizing it, capitalism appeals to the better nature of our, better angels of our nature. Take, for example, transactions. They're voluntary. 
Greed means taking something that doesn't belong to you. Transactions mean you go to a restaurant, as Adam Smith said, you have the butcher and the baker, they provide you with drink and food, you get the food and the drink, they get the money, each gets something in the transaction, it's voluntary. Now some transactions, it's true, are more fun than others. Buying a pair of shoes or a purse or a fancy sports car is much more fun than paying an electricity bill or paying rent. Although human nature being what it is, the people who complain about electricity bills don't hesitate to go out and spend $300 on a pair of blue jeans to look like they came from a dumpster. I mean, it, it, it's just very strange. But, <clears throat> but each, each gets something from the transaction. And capitalism also brings about cooperation without our realizing it. Call it supply chains. Even the simplest product. Look up on, look up on YouTube. I pencil, an essay back from uh, the 1950s talking about all the things that go in the making of a simple pencil. I mentioned the iPhone has $195 of parts, pre-retail, parts from all around the world. China, United States, Malaysia, Germany, Japan, numerous parts all coming together involving hundreds of thousands of people who never know each other. Talk about food, you have a restaurant. You assume farmers are going to grow the food, companies are going to process the food, you're going to get electricity, napkins, stoves, refrigerators, uniforms, utensils, chairs and tables. All that go into your restaurant. Numerous other people supply these things. And so in that sense, not only does it promote cooperation, but also promotes humanity. You may not love your neighbor, but you sure want to sell to your neighbor which means finding out what will make your neighbor want to do a transaction with you, interacting with people. We take it for granted that if you want to succeed in business or in any endeavor, sports or anything else, you want to get the best people possible to make it happen. That, ladies and gentlemen, is new in human affairs. For most of our existence on this earth, you never trusted anyone beyond your immediate family or your immediate village or ethnic group. Very, very narrow. You still see it in a lot of parts of the world today. This, but this idea of taking people you don't even know, don't know their families, bringing them together for a shared purpose, that's fairly new in human affairs. Fairly new. It also helps in, in this way. When you go into business, oftentimes it's not just one person. Obviously, you have to involve a lot of people, but oftentimes it's pairs that do it. I mentioned Apple. Steve Jobs, his partner was Steve Wozniak, each brought something to the table. You take Google, two youngsters, Page and Brin, came together and made this thing happen. Ford Motor Company, which started the modern automobile age over 100 years ago. Two guys, Henry Ford, and a guy you never hear of today, James Cousins. Two people made it happen working together. And, they, and, and, and uh, what an unlikely pair. This also gets to the mystery of life. Henry Ford couldn't operate a corner grocery store. He couldn't even operate a desk. Great mechanic, no good at anything else. Cousins couldn't put anything together. He gave him a model toy. He couldn't do it, all thumbs. Yet this unlikely pair together, who didn't much like each other, created the greatest industrial company in the world. Amazing. So in terms of mystery of life, it's amazing what people can bring to the table that you wouldn't even realize. And so it promotes trust. You think, free markets promoting trust? What are you talking about? It does promote trust. You assume in a restaurant, they assume you're going to pay, even though they bring you the food first. You go to the gas station, you assume the gallon's the same size as it was today, as it was yesterday, and it'll be the same tomorrow. Trust. And free markets bring about instruments that promote trust. It's not just blind faith. Take PayPal. I mean, take eBay. Years ago, when that was invented, the idea that millions of people could interact with each other, how do you get, how do you get a payment system? There, you know, most people can't set up their own credit card system. So PayPal was invented. And it also brings about creativity. I mentioned Page and Brin of Google. Back in the late 1990s, when search engines were just in their infancy, Everyone thought it would be the big companies like Microsoft that would succeed. How could two PhD students out on the West Coast compete against that? Well, they realized something. 
Most of the people who were involved, like Microsoft, initially thought you needed huge servers. These two guys realized, why not replicate the human brain, have a lot of small servers? You know, the human brain, one cell, unimpressive. Put them together, quite impressive. Take these little servers, strap them together, huge consumers of electricity, which is why Apple's farms are right next to hydroelectric plants and the like, huge consumers of electricity, but strap hundreds of thousands of these things together, create huge search engines. And they beat the big guys at their own game. You take, for example, you know, we often think that we have to invent something to succeed. No, keep in mind how you use a tool can bring about huge success, creating resources. Take, for example, the biggest invention that came out of World War II was the creation of the mainframe computer. Computers were initially invented for a very narrow purpose, to more easily calculate, more easily calculate the trajectory of artillery shells. Very, a lot of complicated math, but obviously computers had many more applications than artillery shells. Who succeeded most with mainframe computers, which eventually became minis and then PCs? Who, 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 who made the most money from the mainframe? It wasn't the originator, that company went by. IBM came to dominate the field, so their competitors went by and by. IBM itself, 25 years ago in the early 90s, had one foot in the corporate graveyard. They nearly went down. You know who made the most money from mainframes? It wasn't the makers. It was a guy named Sam Walton. Walmart, Northwestern Arkansas, early 90s. See? This shows liberty does bring the world together. You get people from every place. But so Northwest, Northwest Arkansas, at the time, Sam Walton was a small operation. Kmart at the time was 50 times the size of Walmart. How do you compete against the big guys? Walton figured out that if he uses these mainframes, devises special software, he could manage inventories far better than the big guys. Eventually, the supply chain's better than the big guys. And the rest, as they say, is history. And the sign of success, the sign of success in this country is when people start to come after you and the government comes after you. Walmart's now a villain. That's a sign of success in the United States today. Now, one other example, one other example, and if there are any nutritionists here, I apologize, but Ray Kroc, creator of McDonald's. Ray Kroc, good. There's some smart people here. Now, back in the 1950s, Ray Kroc was a guy who'd been involved in the food business, involved in other business, but doing all right, but never achieved great success. So he's out in California, milkshake machine salesman. And he comes across a hamburger stand called McDonald Brothers. They have a few stands, sees they're doing a great business. And he figures, if I get these guys to expand more, I can sell more milkshake machines. Well, long story short, they didn't see the possibilities. He bought them out and created a national and international chain. Now, why do I cite that? Any of you who've worked in a restaurant know it's the toughest business possible. Toughest business possible. Always high rate of failure. The idea of a national chain was seen as preposterous. Maybe a regional chain like Howard Johnson's in New England, maybe, but a national chain, impossible. What Kroc saw, and keep this in mind, was what the inventors didn't see. You know, some of you may go to a diner, they still have them now and then. One of the great experiences in diners, they have 50-page menus, just go on and on and on. What McDonald's is was standardize a few items of food, hamburger, Coca-Cola, French fries. And by that standardization made it possible to do a national chain. The McDonald brothers didn't realize it, Kroc did. He saw what the others didn't. One quick example, I mentioned Steve Jobs. Back in the late 1970s, he went to Xerox, their research laboratory, and saw something the other guys didn't really realize the significance, which is the mouse. He saw what that could do. The inventors didn't. And by the way, creativity comes in many small ways, not just biggies. I mentioned Starbucks, McDonald's. But you know, when you go to most fast food places, they have three sizes, small, medium, large. Starbucks, even there, they do little things a little differently. What are their sizes? Tall. Tall. So if, if, you, have, if, you, if you have self-esteem issues, 
Go to Starbucks. Tall. Yes, it, 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 it's great. And, and, and what, are the, what, are, what, are they call, what do they call medium? Grande. Ah, oh, it lifts you up. And then big? Venti. Yes. I didn't know what venti meant. My wife, who speaks Italian, did. But I didn't know years ago what latte meant. But like millions, I'd stand in line and say venti latte, pay 20 bucks. Turn, turn, turned out to be great business. Great business. But you know, but you know, in Starbucks, in Starbucks, they have 12 in most of these places, 12 inches, 16 inches, 20 inches cups. But you notice the cup lids are all the same size. That's not a coincidence. Little things like that. So you don't have to have three different size lids for, you, for, for, for your cups. And so in terms of humanity, capitalism is the best thing for humanity. Now people say, well, what about Bernie Madoff? What about these scandals and things like that? Well, as you know, as you know, Human nature, people have been doing bad things long before we had capitalism. Just look at the Bible, people are doing bad things for thousands of years. So we have that underside of human nature. As James Madison, creator of our Constitution, said, if men were angels, we'd not need government, we'd not need laws. Manifestly, we're not angels. Some of you may think, as you get older, maybe grandkids are angels, but only to a certain age. So we do, we do need, we, we do have, we do need laws, sensible laws. But the thing about capitalism is it always turns scarcity into abundance if free markets are allowed to work. For example, I mentioned Henry Ford. 110 years ago, typical car cost over $120,000 in today's dollars. It was a toy for the rich. Then Ford and Cousins and his gifted engineers come along and turn a toy for the rich with a moving assembly line is something every working person could afford. Another example, what we call mobile devices, cell phones. First one, almost 35 years ago, came from Motorola. Big as a shoebox, weighed like a brick, 40-minute battery life, cost $3,995. Now they're giving them away. You're going to have a smartphone, even if you don't have a phone plan, it's going to be 100 bucks, soon 50 bucks. Take widescreen TVs. 15 years ago, they cost $12,000, $18,000. Now, a few hundred bucks, better than ever before. Scarcity into abundance. Another thing about, about free markets is this. I wish economists would stop defining economics as the allocation of scarce resources. That does not get the heart booming. What it is, ladies and gentlemen, is about the creation of resources. Oil. Oil is called a natural resource. There's nothing natural about oil. It's simply glop, gooey stuff. You can't eat it, can't drink it, can't feed it to camels. What makes oil valuable is human ingenuity. Human ingenuity. Turn this glop into something we can't live without. We live in the modern age, information age, microchip, based on sand, silicon. Who knew when you went to the beach, we're not about to run out of sand. They're using that sand could give the whole world at your fingertips. So in terms, in terms of free markets, yes, it has failures. Yes, it has people doing things they shouldn't do. That's been true forever. But the key thing is, in ways we don't even realize, it has us working together. It has us breaking down barriers between people, bringing about cooperation, enhancing humanity instead of crushing it. And in closing, let me just quickly apply it to an area that is in crisis today, health care. Just ask yourself as this debate begins next year, why do we have a health care crisis? And people say, well, it's because people like me are getting older, we want more health care services, prices go up and we have a crisis. But step back for a moment. Why is demand for health care considered a crisis, whereas demand for anything else in this economy is seen as a great opportunity? People want more apps. A lot of writers glad to help you out. People want more cars. A lot of manufacturers in Detroit glad to help you out. People want more adult education. Some people here be very happy to help you out. So what's with health care? Why is demand considered a crisis? It's because, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have real free markets. We don't have real free markets. It's all third party, government, insurance companies, employers, not you, the patient. And the proof of it is if you go to a hospital and clinic and you ask what a treatment costs in advance, you get a very strange look means one of two things, either you're uninsured or you're crazy. Why do you want to know the price? What's it to you? Don't worry about it, insurance will cover it. 
not so much anymore. And to see where the patient lies in that food chain, consider this. The crummiest motel in America wouldn't dare put you in a room with another guest with a curtain in between, a sick guest. They do that routinely in the hospital. They do it all the time. Or robes. You ever go to a hospital, those robes look like they came from a Salvation Army dump? I mean, it, 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 it's because the patient's not the customer. So the key, and, 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 and so you don't have real free marks. We've got to get more patient power in closing. Just one little story in terms of pricing. You don't know what these things cost. And so a friend of mine in New Hampshire, entrepreneur, went to a cardiologist, and the guy says, you know, you need certain tests, including what they call a nuclear stress test, something that puts something in your body, see how the blood flows or whatever. So the guy in all in says, what is it going to cost? The doc says, I have no idea. Insurance will cover it. So this guy, being an entrepreneur and therefore not quite normal, goes out, uses, gets the right numbers, and gets prices at 25 different hospitals and clinics in the region. The prices range from $1,400 to $7,300. Crazy. So he goes back to the cardiologist, true story, and says, I'll, I'll take the $1,400 test, same test, whether it's $1,400 or $7,000. Cardiologist, what? What? That costs $1,400? He said, I never knew. So the doc gets up, does some calculations. He says, you know, Given your condition, you probably really don't need this test. We need patient control. In closing, how do you get more patient control? Nationwide shopping for health insurance instead of state by state. You live in Virginia right now. I live in New Jersey. If you want to buy a policy in West Virginia, yet you're not allowed to do it. You can buy a car in Kentucky. You can't buy the health insurance. Make it nationwide shopping. Have scores of companies compete for your business. A couple of other things which are going to happen next year. Hospitals and clinics posting prices for all their services online, so you don't have to dig it out. How about also having hospitals post each month how many patients die from infections received after they're admitted to the hospital? Scandalous, 90,000 a year. I guarantee you, if you have post that information, those hospitals are going to clean up their act very, very quickly. So in a variety of areas, whether it's health care or anywhere else, with all our imperfections, with all our imperfections, free markets, capitalism will enable us to all enjoy a higher standard of living. And remember this, capitalism, free markets, about creating resources. And when you create resources, you can share resources, you can give away resources and improve the quality of life, not only for yourselves, but for the whole world. Thank you very much.